All right, everyone, in this video, I want to talk about what is the long-term fate of the mid-palatal suture following MSE treatment. The short answer is, I don't know, and I don't think anyone really does, but let's have this video be the beginning of a conversation that we can all have maybe in the comment section below. Your guess is as good as mine, but I just want to put forward some questions for us all to be thinking about. First, a brief background. The MSE, the maxillary skeletal expander, the Wan Moon appliance, splits the mid-palatal suture by anchoring into the bone and then spreading that bone apart. There's a suture that goes right down the middle of your maxilla called the mid-palatal suture, and it breaks up two pieces of maxilla. And that suture in children is quite soft and quite pliable, and in adults becomes more fused. The MSE breaks that suture and then, by means of distraction osteogenesis, the body deposits new bone to fill in that break, just like it would if you were to fracture your arm and you were to have separate pieces of arm bone, the body would deposit bone to then heal that fracture. Same process is happening with the MSE. The first question I want to raise is, what is it that fills in that split? Is it bone, is it scar tissue, or is it something else? Well, Dr. Nuaz once called it bony material. I think what he was getting at was that it's not quite bone and it's not quite scar tissue, and it, it's, we're not really quite sure what it is, but on a CBCT, it looks sort of like bone, okay? Um, the short answer to the question of what is it that fills in the suture is no one really knows but it's bony material. The next question I want to pose is, does whatever happens to the mid-palatal suture, does it interfere with the natural uh, ebb and flow, the natural movement of the cranial bones? So brief background on this. According to osteopathy and according to craniosacral theory, the skull is not a rigid piece of bone. In fact, it's multiple individual bones that are all connected by sutures. That's an anatomical fact. But osteopathy and craniosacral theory go a step further and they say that those bones are actually not stuck in their uh, contiguous position like that. Those bones actually have a kind of a breathing to them as fluid moves through the skull, those bones actually go and a craniosacral therapist or an osteopath can actually feel that rhythm, feel that pulsation with their hands and they can actually manipulate that to correct problems that you might be having. Now do I buy into all that? I don't know. Have I had osteopathic treatment? Yes. Have I had craniosacral tr treatment? one time by a gentleman named John who I used to live at the monastery with. I believe he put his hands on me one time. Um, but look, I certainly am not saying it's not true. What I want to ask is how would MSE affect that flow if that flow really did exist? I would say, again, we don't really know. But here's some food for thought. Assuming that whatever is deposited into the split is some kind of bony-like material that not, is not completely rigid like, like, like the bone of your cranium, right? Wouldn't whatever that bony material be, wouldn't that allow the ebb and flow to continue? Wouldn't it allow that pulsation of the cranial bones to continue? Why wouldn't it? Why wouldn't it? Unless it is super hard, rigid stuff, then that natural ebb and flow of the new suture, if you could call it that, should be able to continue. So I suspect that the MSE is not a risk to uh, the natural flow of the cranium and of the skull bones according to craniosacral and osteopathic theory. Do you disagree? Well, let's talk about it in the comments section below. 
Next, what I want to talk about are funky neurological symptoms that might result from disrupting the mid-palatal suture and perhaps interfering with the uh, natural rhythms of the movement of cranial bones. All I can say about this is I have not had any of those symptoms. So if n equals 1, with the patient in study being me, the evidence suggests that there are not, at least in the short term, crazy neurological symptoms that result from the MSE. Now, I am a good candidate for, for looking into this question because I am a neurological mess. I am a migraine patient. So neurologically, I am extremely sensitive. And has the MSE increased my frequency of headaches? No, it hasn't. Okay, now granted, I have been uh, very much on top of my health in general since starting the MSE. I run every day and I eat very um, low carb, uh, mostly carnivore. And I, you know, I've been managing my psychological stress. I do everything in my power to reduce headache triggering. So the fact that my headaches have been minimal doesn't really speak to the fact that, you know, maybe that's because I do so good managing it with all the lifestyle stuff. But the MSE has definitely not uh, set me off neurologically, at least since the first couple weeks of expanding with it, which were very traumatic neurologically, and I've spoken about that in prior videos. So... I don't know whether years from now, neurological symptoms are all of a sudden going to bubble up, and I can't stand here and tell you they won't. All I can say is, up to this point, no, the MSE and whatever possible impact it's had on the larger system has not resulted in any kind of neurological uh, disaster for me. So um, that's it for now. Uh, and. If there's anything else that comes up on this subject, please pose the question in the comment section below and I will think about it and address it in a future video. But <clears throat> in general, I would conclude with this. I know it's an interesting academic question to ask, what is the fate of the suture following MSE expansion? What I would say to you is there's risk, okay? There's risk that whatever happens to that suture would have some kind of negative outcome. I haven't experienced that negative outcome yet, but it's possible that it may. But I would say to you, isn't there also a risk in not doing the MSE? If you're someone who's, who needs the MSE for breathing purposes, for oral volume purposes, or even for, you know, just boosting that smile and boosting that aesthetic, there's a risk to not doing the MSE. You know that if you don't do it, you will continue to have whatever issues you're having. So there's risk if you do it, and there's risk if you don't. And is the fear of whatever happens to the suture, this kind of academic question of what is it that fills in that suture, and the fact that no one really knows, is that a reason to not pursue the treatment? It wouldn't be for me. It wouldn't be for me. If the suture becomes different, does it necessarily interfere with the ebb and flow of the craniosacral motion of the skull? I don't think so. Does it cause neurological symptoms? Not for me. To me, you know, that's some food for thought. So let's continue the conversation below. All right, everyone, that's it for now. Peace.